Right. Um, hey folks, lovely to be here. I really appreciate you all showing up. So yeah, I'm going to talk about something that I'm really excited about. It's an open source library that I've been working on for quite a bit. It's called Hamilton. And I'm going to talk about how it can help you write uh, feature engineering workflows that can work in different contexts. That's why I call it write once, run everywhere. Right. So what I want to tell you about today, um, first, I want to talk about the challenges around feature engineering and why writing portable feature engineering code is hard. Uh, then I want to convince you that state-of-the-art approaches generally aren't flexible or powerful enough. Hamilton, the open source library, can help you write code to run in multiple contexts and keep your code organized and clean. Hamilton is easy to get started with and easy to use. So these are the take homes. Uh, a little bit at first about the company that I help run. It's called Dagworks. Um, at Dagworks, we're making machine learning pipelines easy to manage. Nobody should be afraid to inherit data science code. It's kind of our goal. Uh, but that's not really the point of this talk. It's tangential, um, and I'm not selling anything. This is all open source, and it is easy to get started with. Install on uh, PyPy. We also have Conda. Um, get started in less than 15 minutes. You can try it out at tryhamilton.dev, and we've got all sorts of great documentation. Um, highly recommend you try out tryhamilton.dev. It runs everything in the browser, so you can sort of mess around and have a nice little sandbox mode. Cool. So on the agenda today, first I'm going to talk about the problem with feature engineering, what actually makes it challenging. Then I want to talk about Hamilton, the solution we came up with. Then I'm going to talk about how you can use Hamilton for feature engineering, not to write once and run in multiple contexts. I'm going to focus in on the batch and streaming context, but you can also use it in a variety of other contexts. It's just Python code and you can run it anywhere. Then I'm going to talk about sort of additional benefits of Hamilton and why you might want to use it. And finally, I'll discuss our open source progress, the community, and some updates. Cool. So let's start with the problem with feature engineering. All right, so why is feature engineering hard? Well, let's look at a common scenario, and we'll be sort of like building this scenario through the course of the talk. Uh, it actually comes from my old company. It's sort of adapted from there. So this is a real life thing. Um, customers fill out a survey result when they sign up for your platform, and your model makes predictions. Right, uh, we could be predicting anything. We could be predicting sort of their lifetime value as a customer, or whether to show them the best inventory or not, whatever it is. Um, and finally, your goal is to get the survey results to the model that you've trained, so you can uh, run your predictions and serve them to the customer. The things that make this tricky are you've got multiple contexts. So survey results are trickling in in a streaming mode. That means every time a user signs up, you want to process it as quickly as possible. Uh, data comes in nightly dumps. This is batch. Um, sometimes the streaming stuff missed the data. Sometimes it got changed over the course of the day. Whatever it is, you want sort of like a source of truth that you can snapshot. You've got multiple teams working together. So there's different sets of features, different sets of infrastructure, and different sets of data. And your features are derived from your data, right? So your model is just a function of functions of functions of features. Right. Sorry, data. All right, uh, so this is a visual representation of it. You've got your customer surveys coming in, your batch data, your browsing data, uh, sign data, et cetera, coming in. It all goes into sort of the same set of feature transformations, which I'm breaking into three categories, map, aggregation, joins. I'll play what they mean in a minute. Uh, and then it goes into sort of model training and inference. You can do a lot with these features. Train it in batch, serve results, snapshot the results. You can even train it live if you're feeling ambitious, although people don't do that all that much these days. Um, and we're gonna focus in on the feature transformation piece. So these are three types of operations, map, aggregations, and joins. Right? Map is a one-to-one -one, uh, feature in to feature out. It's sort of two different, perhaps two different features, um, but on a row-wise operations. Aggregations are taking a vector of features and mapping it to perhaps a scalar or to a smaller vector. And then joins and queries are uh, connecting two sets of features together and forming sort of a third join set of features. Right? Cool. So uh, the context for this, um, we want to uh, run it on tables in our, your data warehouse for your training data or for batch inference. We want to run inside a streaming processor for near real time. We perhaps want to transform browsing data live. So if you have sort of features that are generated on the fly and you want to get a prediction as soon as possible, you know, and that, we're not going to talk about that. That's a sort of natural extension. And the complications are when you get to non-batch mode, how you handle all these things. Right, so a join means a different thing in streaming and batch mode. In batch mode, a join is a sort of loading of a table and doing a SQL statement to join or whatever. And in streaming mode, a join is a query to another service, right? Uh, so yeah, how do you handle joins? 
and differences between them. How do you include aggregations in streaming mode, right? Because you might do some sort of mean value, but you're not going to be recomputing that mean, so perhaps you store it or perhaps you do recompute it. And how do you track lineage versions, et cetera, for different data sources? Right, so the current approaches, um, sort of the state of the art that I've seen tends to fall into two different extremes. So on the one side, there's context-specific execution. This is writing uh, one set of code, one sort of piece of code for each context, right? You've got batch code, you've got streaming code. Uh, they're not really linked. Um, so it's cumbersome to manage. Two sets of tests, two sort of different sets of versions of features that you have to manage. And the big question is, do they match? Which is tough to work with. On the other hand, there's new feature DSLs to unify it. They're tougher to grok since it's sort of a DCL, like a specific set of operations. It's limited to them uh, and opinionated on aggregations and joins. So these are valuable, but I don't think give you quite the flexibility. Hamilton, the framework that we came up with, allows you to be right in the middle. So the idea is, can we write everything using normal Python code and normal Python functions and make it dry so you don't repeat yourself? Make it so it's applicable in all settings. Make it so it's fully customizable. You decide how to do joins, you decide your own aggregation approach, you write map functions however you want, and you bring your own infrastructure, but it's all just plain old Python code, right? And you want it to be self-documenting and imply structure. The big idea is that if uh, you have to hand this off to somebody else, or you do the proof of concept and you want somebody to productionize it, it should be pretty easy to read the code just from the code itself. Cool, so the solution we came up with to do all of this is Hamilton, and it's pretty simple. Um, as a spoiler, if you've ever seen PyTest fixtures, it's kind of like taking that idea to an extreme and adding some sort of type safety. Right, so the question is, the idea was what if every feature uh, corresponded to exactly one Python function? And what if the way that function was written told you everything you needed to know about the feature? That's exactly Hamilton. In Hamilton, the artifact is determined by the name of the function, and the dependencies are determined by the parameters. So we're gonna be doing a lot of like data frames and series stuff, but it works with any Python object. Uh, so what it looks like is instead of doing this type of thing, where you do like operations on a sort of monolithic data frame, you declare each one as a function, right? So C is a function of A and B, so turns A plus B, D is a function of C, et cetera. Again, Hamilton supports all Python objects. Uh, you can kind of do whatever you want. You don't even have to do series, you can just do data frames. Um, and sort of very, very much structure it the way you want. So uh, to drive this home, instead of that, uh, here this, the output is the function name, right? So C turns into the function name, and the inputs are the function arguments. A and B in this case come from somewhere outside. So the full hello world example uh, has one more piece, which is called the driver, and this driver does a few extra things. Uh, it tells you what and when to execute. So uh, you import the driver, import the sort of module you defined above, instantiate the driver, pass it in some data, and use the module. Uh, execute it, and you're good to go. This is like a very basic ETL. Cool, so the TLDR, for each transform, you write a function. Functions, declare a DAG, a directed asymptotic graph. If you're not familiar with the term, it's just a way of, like, I mean, it's a, it's a computer science data structure, but I'm using it to sort of structure computation. It's a very common way people use DAGs. Um, that's our DAG, C depends on C, C depends on MV, and Hamilton handles DAG execution, right, using the driver. It's, it's pretty simple, and that's, there's a little more to it, um, but not all that much more. So we've got, all the, we've got a few extensions uh, that came from this question, doesn't Hamilton make your code more verbose? Right, so you might say, oh, I had all these awesome for loops, and I had sort of these like crazy nested things, and then I only had to write one line per function beforehand. I wanna say yes, um, the Hamilton might be a little more code, but that's not always a bad thing. Uh, code is read like 10 times as much as it's written, and verbose, verbose code in a nice structure can be really clear to read. And it's not boilerplate, it's just slightly more verbose. But in the case that it is problematic or that it is a bad thing, we have all these extra decorators, right? So you've got a tag to attach metadata, parameterized to run a function over different uh, sets of data. Extract columns will take a data frame and I put a node for multiples for each series. Uh, we're not gonna talk about data validation, but there's a whole sort of data validation ecosystem there. And something that is important for this talk is config.when we'll be using it to distinguish between batch and streaming mode, um, which allows you to write sort of conditional transforms. In, uh, when the config is set to one value, you use transform A, otherwise use transform B. All right, so how does this framework, which has all these nice properties, help you write once and run everywhere? 
Well, the idea is, for the most part, you write one feature per function. Uh, for map operations, you do uh, sort of single versus bulk operations are equivalent. Um, so you go, so it's often that I find myself going from like large bulk sets that you perhaps want to distribute over Spark or something to uh, sort of smaller batches that you want to process to individuals. And you can actually just use all pandas series if you want, or whatever sort of like vectorized computation engine you have. Um, the latency penalty is going to be way less from that than like whatever network call you're inevitably, make, inevitably making. Uh, for aggregations, you choose. You can store, compute on the fly, update regularly, whatever you want. It'll all sort of work along with Hamilton. And for joins, you use query instead of join. Uh, the trick here is there are small pieces that you write slightly differently, uh, and the rest of it you can sort of use all the same. All right, so you just re-implement the parts you need to. Uh, so write once, run everywhere. It's for the vast majority of it. And then the pieces that control like the external glue code to the rest, you can uh, swap out on the fly. All right, so back to our scenario. Let's make it a little more concrete. We've got some simple map operations. Uh, we take our raw survey data, and we get a few features, say budget, gender, and age. Uh, we've got our derived features. Uh, we'll say for budget, we derive whether they're a high roller, let's spend a lot of money, is male, is female. We've got joins, so we want to, our model likes to know the time since the last login. There's the function of the client IDs and the login data. And then aggregation, right? So we want to do some normalization of the age, which is a function of mean of age and standard deviation of age, right? Where mean and standard deviation are scalars and age is a vector. So what does this look like in batch? Let's build the ETL out piece by piece. Um, so the goal here is to compute features and for the model batch, this could easily be applied for its training. It's like pretty flexible. Uh, but we're gonna go out and inference for now. And the context is we've got a database with raw survey results. This is sort of our main database. Uh, some other engineering team probably populates it. We've got a database with client login data. So this will wanna join with that so we can get that last logged in feature. We've got a model that's already trained. Again, you can use this for training, but let's just say we have the model trained already for inference. And the data is of a reasonable size. We can do all sorts of scaling stuff too with Hamilton. Um, it's really framework agnostic, but just now we're gonna say everything fits in Pandas data frames. Cool. So uh, data loading looks something like this. Hopefully this code is fairly familiar. Um, we're just reading some SQL, right? Select star uh, from our table. You probably have in real life a slightly more advanced condition. And then we're getting out the budget, age, gender, and a client ID column, right? And the data looks something like this. We've got two inputs, the database and the table, goes into survey results, and then we expand that out into client ID, gender, budget, and age. All right, so we started our ETL. Let's, let's uh, add some use to it, add some value to it. So we've got these math functions, right? Is male, is female, is high roller? This stuff should be like dead simple, right? If you want to figure out how this works, it's just like simple operations on Pandas series. And now, once we add it to our pipeline, we have these as features, right? We've got three of the features our model needs. This is all very simple, just a few functions. So, uh, for joins, we've got uh, something slightly more complicated. We also have another thing. This could probably fit inside data loaders if we wanted, um, but we read our SQL, our table. Um, then uh, we do a pandas merge to get the last logged in time and we subtract it to get the time since last time. All right, so we've taken an execution time. And now, we've got a few more things, right? We've got a whole sort of join side of the DAG, and then a time since last log. We've got four of our five features. All right, uh, let's talk next about aggregations. Um, and this is exactly how you think about implementing aggregation. Just call dot mean, call that standard deviation, and then normalize, right? Simple as that. Note that we can also have floats along with series. Pandas, uh, sorry, uh, Hamilton is data type agnostic, so you can sort of interchange between them as long as the input type corresponds to the output type. As long as the input type of the, of the consumer corresponds to the output type of the producer. And here's what it looks like. We got our age, age standard deviation, age mean, and age normalized, and now our model has all the features it needs so that we can run model inference. There are other ways that are cleaner in Hamilton to join all this data. This is just to make it really clear. Um, but we have one function creating our model's data, and the other function that takes in our model, which is passed in from the outside world, and runs the prediction. So here's our whole model inference pipeline, right? And I think this is a sort of toy example, but I've seen these get much larger on the order of perhaps hundreds of features, each of which has very different things. It has potentially different configurations. 
So uh, what is the, to tie it all together, what does the driver look like? This is in your ETL script. Um, simple, you just instantiate your driver, pass in all the modules that we just created, uh, pass in some inputs that you need for that run, and execute it. There you go. You're probably going to want to do something with this in frame. So this is the E and the T part of your ETL. All right, so what does this look like in streaming mode? Well, that looks the context, um, and again, the reason that I really wanted to sort of present about a flexible framework is this is just one context, but you can pretty easily adapt it to other cases. Right, so say you have a service that gives you client login data instead of a table you want to join. You have stored aggregations from training. So in something equivalent to the other workflow, we've saved the age mean and age standard deviation. And the goal is to make it near real time, meaning you want to predict as soon as raw data is available and pre-populate it for our users, right? So they sign up and the uh, login data is available for them. What are the changes required? Well, we don't have an aggregation available. We're not going to do aggregating on the fly, so we have to load it up externally. We want to swap out the external join with the API call, and we have single datums and not data frames, but we're going to kind of treat them the same here. Um, so, cool. Uh, so we're going to go back to our friend config.wen and sweep out just the features or really nodes that we need to change. So these four are going to be different, and the thing to note here is these should all actually look pretty similar to what we had before. It actually makes detail a little simpler because we're sort of loading data, we're certainly passing stuff in, um, and short-circuiting a few of the operations. But the interesting thing is that they end with this double underscore piece, and the Hamilton parser actually just strips that double underscore out. It's just a way so that if you have two implementations of a function in the same file, you can run it uh, and not have not have name conflicts so we can parse the file. So we've got our server result streaming. This just takes in a list of uh, list of survey records. Say this comes from like a Kafka processor or something. Uh, we just created a data frame. We're good to go. Now it looks the same exact way that it did in the previous setting. We've got our uh, stream our last logged in data. This is just creating a series out of your uh, you have a bulk query here, uh, and then the scalars that we've got, the aggregations, which actually just loaded up. Um, I think a common strategy I've seen for that is to have the model know about aggregations, because it's the model object you're updating on the regular, uh, and the aggregation model was trained with that, you can uh, then ask the model for it too. A bunch of ways to do this. But the idea here is all of this data, we're sort of gluing in to match with data from a different context, right? And by the time it gets in here, it looks exactly the same, so that you know that everything downstream of this will be exactly the same. And all you have to do is test this to make sure that it provides data in a reasonable shape. So, what does this all look like? Uh, the red pieces are the ones we've changed. I should probably compare it. Um, this is a little simpler because we're just sort of querying or pre-calculated a bunch of these. Um, but overall, it looks pretty much the same, right? And in the driver, imagine this is just like in a stream processor that could process pieces in batch, uh, in like small mini batches perhaps, either batches of one, batches of 10, whatever. Uh, this is like, you know, every, every company I've been at has some sort of like framework on top of Kafka that delegates down or some sort of streaming framework. Uh, and this is code that would fit really naturally in it. All right, so we have our config, which tells us to use which functions to use. Create our driver with all the same uh, modules. And we then pass in some inputs. We don't have the database and the table stuff, because we're not actually loading data. And we are good to go. Execute and return the values. So we've got a list of our predictions. Cool. So that's the write once run everywhere piece. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the additional benefits of Hamilton. So I hope to convince you that you get all this cool stuff around, um, around sort of streaming and batch and using in different contexts. And you get some great software engineering practices. So uh, yeah, in addition to the portable feature engineering code, uh, Hamilton lets you write transforms of Python function, and sort of enables or almost forces you to. And in turn, a change, you get everything you need. Right? So unit testing is really simple. You've just got plain old Python functions. Use PyTest, whatever, um, write some test cases. You're good to go. You know it's broken into functions, so you can trust it. For documentation, you can actually just use the doc strip. We have all sorts of tooling to help out. Like, I've built all sorts of tooling for to help out with that. Um, and it's sort of naturally self-documenting, but also the structure of the code, it's broken into little pieces, so it is naturally self-documenting. By definition also, it's modular, both as in it's broken into functions that are really easy to work with, and then broken into modules that are easy to work with as well. 
Uh, so you don't have to worry about your code turning into spaghetti code. Uh, Ableton also kind of gives you a data catalog in that it doesn't store your data, but it forms the sort of central feature definition store. So you know your code is pretty close to the data you've got. For debugging, um, you can execute functions individually, you can have breakpoints, you can do all of these, uh, you can do like kind of binary searches through your stuff to figure out where the data was weird. Um, having it all in a DAG where it's delegated functions makes it really easy to handle. And the data, you can, um, you can build that tooling really easily to make it so you trust your data. So there's validation included out of the box with that uh, checkout hood decorator, happy to talk more about that at a different time. Um, that's outside the scope of this. And finally, let's talk about open source progress and updates. So early stages, but a thriving community, um, lots of really exciting users. These are just a dabbling of companies that we've talked to who are using it. There are a bunch more. A growing set of core contributors, um, people sort of starting to add things to it, uh, come up, like make pull requests, uh, build apps with like different pieces, plugins, and a full company dedicated to building it, that's us. We're looking for contributors, bug hunters, and user feedback, so if you're interested, I got all sorts of contact information afterwards. Uh, and we're in progress on quite a few uh, exciting things. So we're building out a set of more expressive APIs. Um, we built easy loading and saving of data, and we want to extend that to a decorator for loading up SQL, so you can do sort of like basic SQL loads as well. This could be, and this would replace that like select star in there. You could have a nice way to sort of like templatize it. And we're listening to ideas all the time. With execution, we're thinking of building it so that your Hamilton code can compile down to an orchestration framework. So you write in Hamilton, and then you get Airflow, right? And we know how to break that up for you. So you don't have to think about any of the lower level orchestration details. We're looking at a generator support for mini batch training. So that if you want to uh, process through your data a bunch of times, you could do that and uh, update your model. And more sort of first class PySpark integration. We do have PySpark integration in multiple ways. Uh, we're looking to sort of build out more examples and make that clear for people to work with. Um, but it also already works with like polars and uh, pandas happily. And yeah, again, taking ideas. So yeah, give Hamilton a try. We love your feedback. Try Hamilton on dev, install it. Give us a star on GitHub. We're vain. We like stars. And uh, yeah, create voting issues and then join us on Slack. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, here's like a link tree, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. I swapped those the logos, but yeah, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, GitHub. You can email me and just feel free to scan this, save it, and then reach out to me later. Uh, if you just search my name online, you'll find a way to contact me. So yeah, that's it. That's you. Thank you so much, folks. So it's time for some questions. Anyone has questions? Please. So how this integrates with Pandas? Because I'm not using the passing series as an input argument, right? Yep. So you, you can't do like lambda, you know, apply lambda input as you go to Pandas. Uh, you can do it. I mean, you can do that within the functions, right? Um, but you're, are you saying you could apply the whole thing to lambda, like? Like, like, are you like the like you're talking about like the map apply over a series type thing? Yeah, so that's totally doable. You do that within the functions. Within the functions. Yeah, within the functions. Um, now you could also invert it and apply a whole DAG to a pandas thing if you really wanted to. So there are a bunch of other ways to do it. So it's kind of up to you, but it's it's not really opinionated on how you use pandas. Um, so you would have like, let's say you have like a series of operations that you wanted. I mean, that's it, you should probably, like, always worth considering using vectorized stuff. Um, but if you have a, or like a compiled Python type thing. Um, but yeah, you can have it inside the functions if you want. You can make the functions a little longer if you have a bunch of them that kind of go together and always will. So. Any more, please? So if the load to the is data print that has the same columns in both, how does it resolve which column to pass to which column? Yeah, so it's, there's a little nuance here in that if you have two that have the same columns, you're going to want to rename them. Uh, but it doesn't actually look at the columns to determine the nodes. It looks at what you tell it the columns are. Right, so you could do a load and then rename. Um, we're thinking of adding a rename in the extract columns piece. Uh, you could add a prefix. You could do a join, whatever. Like, But you just can't have two. They're, the name is going to be unique between nodes. So if you have two that have the same name, you have to name it specifically, or you could have the same function, load both of them, and then decide it there. Yeah. 